Yo, everybody. Welcome to Off Panel, a weekly interview podcast about all things comics. I'm your host, David Harper, and I'm at Emerald City Comic Con in Seattle with the writer of Uncanny X-Men, Four Kids Walk Into a Bank, and more. It's Matthew Rosenberg. Thanks for coming on. Oh, yeah. Thank you for having me. So let's, let's start with where we are. I mean, we're at a con. It's the, the bit first con of the season. It's my second, but yeah. It's your second? What was before this? Uh, I did Arizona, Ace Comic Con in Arizona. In oh, January. okay. Yeah. So how has this con went for you? Uh, this is great. Uh, it is one of my favorite shows uh, yeah. in one of my favorite cities. I have some very close friends who live here, so it is a very near and dear city to me mm-hmm. beyond that. But uh, it's one of the best artist alleys in all of comics, and it's, so it's always just fun because it's full of people and and really enthusiastic fans. So Yeah, I like how it feels like everybody is so close and they're on the same floor, so it's like sometimes you co- you walk around and... I'll come up and there's like a creator talking to another creator and it's just it feels very familial in a way that a lot of cons don't. Yeah, for sure. It's uh there there are a bunch of cons, like I know Heroes Con and, and Thought Bubble and a few others that that like people go to because it is just more of a like hangout party than other shows. And I'm, I I sort of study it to be like, what are they doing different? And I I've never quite put my finger on it, but like this is definitely one of those shows that is like People are here to see friends and, and hang out as much as anything else. Yeah. I also do uh, worse at this show than at other shows. I've, uh, I've heard that. Um, and I always assumed that it's because there's a huge uh, artist alley. And it's like, why would you buy a book for me when like I'm sitting across from Matt Fraction or like sure. whoever? And then last year I was like, or maybe just Seattle doesn't like me very much. Um, but either way, I'm cool with it because it's a fun time anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. It's been a, I don't know, the, the con has been kind of interesting because I've talked to some people. I talked to one person who thought that it was a good thing that the celebrities are like three blocks away. Oh, yeah. And then I was talking to somebody earlier who was like, it is not, because then you don't have like the incidental traffic walking through there. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I have no thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've heard both sides where it's like, oh, it's nice we're not drowned by people just trying to get to the cast of Boy Meets World. Sure. And then I've heard people be like, I really want that Boy Meets World money. Yeah, yeah. So, who knows? Um, so, we, we talked about this a little bit before. I'm curious about, you know, you're, you're currently writing the X-Men. Uh, reading your writing kind of feels like you have background with them. What is what is your comic book origin story and does, like, the X-Men fit into that? Um, like, what you were reading when you were growing up. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, uh, I have an older brother who's four years older than me, and he was a Marvel guy for not that long, uh, to the point that I've said this in an interview once before, and he saw it, and he was like, did I read comics? And I was like, oh, and I have his comic collection, so I had to show him books. And I was like, you had this? And he's like, oh, I remember these. Um, but uh, I looked up to my brother, and he was very cool, and the stuff he was into, I wanted to be into. So I, I literally learned to read reading uh, Chris Claremont's X-Men. Mm. Um, and... You know, I, I remember reading Dark Phoenix as a as a little kid, and and not having any idea what was going on, and just being like, I have no idea what this is, but I love it so much. Yeah. And then you know, being a teenager and being like, I'm going to go back and reread it, and be like, I still don't really know what's going on, but I love it so much. <laughs> and now uh, I'm a grown up, and I still feel the same. Yeah. Uh, but no, I yeah, I just read stuff when I was a kid, and I I have the weird. Um, both my parents are writers, and when I was growing up, um, there was, you know, I had an allowance, and, <clears throat> you know, I, I was not particularly affluent or anything, um, but my parents' rule was always, if you want to read something, we'll pay for it, like sure. if you want to go to a bookstore. And early on, I found out that, that the loophole in that was also comics, mm-hmm. and my parents were like, if you want a comic, we'll buy it for you. Um, you know, if I wanted to go to a movie, like, that's my allowance, and that's... Uh, you know, that means I'm not going to get a toy next week or whatever. But, uh, and I have the weird fact of I grew up with a comic book store on my block in New York oh, City. Yeah. Nice. Like, uh, I had to cross one street to get to it. And so that was my, my parents worked out a deal with a comic shop that they were, I just had a, a tab and I would go in and grab stuff. And That's amazing. Week, yeah. It was really great. Um, so I was very, very spoiled with comics as a kid. Um, and I just never, you know, I just consumed as many comics as I could and loved them so much. And I just sort of never really lost that. Um, I know a lot of people, like, have periods where they're, like, 
They're I, out for three years or something. Yeah, and like I, I discovered girls or I discovered drugs or like, you know, I, I whatever it is. And I, I, uh, uh, I didn't have that. I just always was like kind of a comics guy through and through. Um, but X-Men was my, not just gateway to comics, but X-Men was my gateway to literacy. Sure. <laughs> so it's, uh, they're very near and dear to me. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I know that one of the things that I, uh, I think is really interesting about you is I met you last year at Comics Pro's annual, su- or annual meeting? Yes. Yeah, annual meeting. I was going to say summit. That seems wrong. But anyways, and when I was there, we, we talked very briefly about how you worked in a comic shop. Yes. And I think that is a really interesting experience. Like Joe Keating is, is a pal of mine, and he says that he thinks it's important for creators to like know how a shop works. Oh, 100%, 100%. How does that influence your thinking? Not necessarily for X-Men, just but for comics in general, I guess. Oh, I mean, it's everything. Uh, you know, I, I uh, before I was a comic book writer, I, I worked in the music industry and some other had some other jobs. And I actually, when I wanted to write comics and take it seriously and do it, um, I actually quit a job where I was making pretty decent money, but it was taking up all my time. And I was like, I don't have time to write. I don't have the energy. I would come home and just like sleep and, you know, read some comics or watch a TV show and go to bed. And, you know, I, I said to my girlfriend, I said, you know, I, I, I want to quit my job and like really focus on writing. And she said, well, we'll need some money. And I said, yeah, I, I think I want to work in a comic book store so that I can understand better like what I'm asking a comic store to do if I'm saying, if I have to call a comic shop and be like, hey, would you carry my book? I need to know what that means. Like, I think it's really important. And that was my my impetus for doing it. So I worked at Forbidden Planet in New York um, for two years, maybe a little less, I think two years. Um, and uh, it was the most, it was so informative. And, and I meet so many pros now who have the same experience of like, you, you pick up so much of the way, you know, what you're asking a reader and, and like how people react to seeing a book on a shelf and what you're asking a retailer to do when you want them to carry your book. And um, all that stuff is, I think, so important. And I think there are a lot of comics pros and I think people in publishing who don't understand right. like, what the ask is. Uh, Forbidden Planet in New York was especially like formulative for me in some ways because uh, they're not a back issue store. They don't sell back issues. So if something doesn't sell off the wall in the first couple of weeks, it's burned money. It's lost revenue. It's, you know, it's the same as, you know, a restaurant that's ordered food they can't sell and it's ending up in the dumpster, essentially. Um, they don't put the comics in the dumpster. Right. But, uh, it is it is just lost revenue. And so that, to me, you know, when I worked there, I would I would be involved in the ordering and the buying, and and I'd be like, I think this book is important. I think we can sell it. And like, when you're wrong, you're costing people money. Right. Um, and so I have a lot of that's fueled me a lot in in sort of my career of just like, I don't like seeing a big stack of my books on a shelf. Like I, I say to retailers all the time, like, you let me know what you think would help you move the book, and like I will do whatever I can. And um, so that's that's been important to me, but also like, just the idea of uh, my favorite thing to do was uh, watch how people react to like the new release wall, right? And like, what catches someone's eye, what what they pick up, and when I was making my career on books, that was like a really big thing for me because I just remember a time when someone came in and they were like, "I'm looking for a book. It's a new book," and I said, "Okay," and they said, "I'm looking for." Uh, Warren Ellis's The Woods. And I was like, mm. I was like, James Tynan wrote The Woods. I think you mean trees. And they were like, no, I'm looking for Warren Ellis's The Woods. And I had to like get both books out and be like, which one are you looking for? <laughs> um, and that to me, I was like, okay, people are like having trouble with these one word titles. And so I, I get made fun of a lot because I have books, We Can Never Go Home and Four Kids Walk Into a Bank and What's the Furthest Place From Here. And people get the names wrong all the time. And they're like, what's the furthest, you know, how four kids go into a bar and whatever. And I don't care that they get them wrong because when they go into a shop and start talking about it, people know what it is. Yeah. It's and, easy to mistake trees in the woods. It's hard to, like, four kids yeah. are near a financial institution. <laughs> yeah. It's like you'll get there. Yeah. And no one has ever been like, uh, yeah, I want to pick up uh, that book, We Can Never Go Home. And then they're like, oh, no, I meant trees. Like, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Like, 
So, uh, that, I mean, that was, it's a, it's a silly example, but like I approach, you know, cover design, I approach all of it in that way of like trying to, trying to make books stand out in a, in a sea of comics because there's, you know, a couple hundred comics come out every week and right, right. you're fighting for every inch of attention and like when you work in retail, you're really well aware of that, like how much people are, how much each inch of space on a, on a wall is worth. Mm -hmm. So that right. was, that was all very big for me. Also it was a great community, like my, the people I worked with at Forbidden Planet, um, a really sort of staggeringly large percentage of them went on to like work in comics mm -hmm. um, after I left. Uh, which is awesome because uh, Tyler Boss, who uh, drew Four Kids Walking to a Bank, worked with me there. Uh, Vita Ayala, who's doing stuff at Marvel and and Valiant and Vault and Black Mask, uh, worked with me and um, just just a ton. Uh, Anna Peterson, who went on to work at Fantagraphics. Matthew Klein, who works at Valiant. Like we all work together. Like if you went into Forbidden Planet on a Tuesday night, like everyone who's working in that time period is now like a comics professional. That's so, amazing. Yeah, it's really fun. Um, and my, my friend Danny, who uh, still works there, she has a book coming out through Vault later this year. Um, and it, so it's still like that kind of space. Yeah. Which is very fun. Um, a good sense of community grew up from it. So that was really nice to be a part of. I feel like working in a shop would probably help you understand what retailers respond to and also how how tight their time is and how little opportunity you have to really make an impact with what you're sending them because like for for four kids walk into a bank you know you're trying to get a retailer to buy this book like yeah. what do you send them what do you send them to try to move the needle um yeah my the first thing i ever did like uh you know i used to answer the phone at forbidden planet and pros would call and i'd be like it's wednesday at two o'clock, like I don't have 10 minutes right. to hear your pitch, like absolutely not. And I'm like, I'm sorry, good luck, like call back Thursday at 11 p.m. and I'll talk to you, but yeah. like I can't now. Um, so that was a big thing for me, I was, like, I was like, I can't act like I'm entitled to any retailer's time, mm -hmm. like I'm just not. And so I've always, I do my best to like send books, physical books to people when I can. And I always say like, please show it to the staff, like pass it around, let everyone who works there see it. Like, because that's who's hand selling the books, not just, you know, the owner and the buyer, like everybody is. Um, I always try to make stickers and posters and stuff to give to people where it's like, you don't have to give it to them now, they don't know what it is, but like put it behind the register and when the book comes out, like incentivize people, like here's something to do. Um, and kind of just trying to give people the tools they need to sell the book if they want. I mean, it's really, you know, every shop is different and every every uh, bit of comic culture, like each shop is its own unique ecosystem, but yeah. like there is a, uh, I wanna be able to be like, uh, can I be a part of that ecosystem in some way? Is there a way I fit? And there's shops who are just like, I can't sell your stuff or like, you know, I, I remember talking to a shop once and they were like, it's just not worth my time sure. to try and sell your book. And I was like, okay, you know, I, I remember actually the, the talking to the shop owner and he was really nice to give me his time and explain it to me. And I was like, he's like, why should I give you the time? And I said, because I'm the creator who called you and was on the phone with you. Right. Um, is that worth anything to you? And like, I'm asking you what I could do to go above and beyond. And he was like, honestly, like, I, it's just worth my time to try and sell Batman, like a couple more copies of Batman. And I explained why I didn't think that was true. And um, we had a really nice conversation about it. And uh, it was really good, and I, it was very informative for me. And then a few years later, when I started writing X-Men, he was like, come sign in my shop, and I got to be like, well, it's not really worth my time. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm a little vindictive and petty, but also, uh, you know, he was, he was really helpful to me in understanding, like, you know, it's, it's, is it worth his time to sit down and read a book to try and sell two copies and make himself four dollars? Sure. And it's like no, it's worth his time to be able to get thirty people who might buy Batman, who weren't buying it before. So, you know, uh, that's a big thing for me is just like never feeling entitled to anyone's shelf space or time, and just saying like, well, how how can I earn it? Mm -hmm. Like, what can I do to earn this from you? Um, that's how I always approach talking to retailers.
Yeah. I mean, the, the interesting thing is, is like, uh, a good example I often use is uh, Nathan, uh, Nathan Fairbairn and Matt Smith did a comic called Lake of Fire through Image. Sure, yeah. Great book. Uh, the funny thing about it is, is if you talk to Nathan about it, he like immediately knows the person who sold so many books for him. Sure, yeah. Uh, J.P. Jordan in Big Bang Comics in Dublin. Yeah. Like he was an evangelist for the book. He loved the book, and he just sold it like crazy. Yeah. And it's like you might have interactions like that, but you might also have somebody that buys in and like evangelizes for for, for kids who walk into yeah. Walk it's into it's a bank. certainly no one at Big Bang because that's a, no. I'm joking. That's a <laughs> well, great you signed thing. there, didn't you? I did. I love I love everyone there. Um, uh, that is a great store. That is. Um, uh, sort of an idealized version of what a comic shop could be to me. Um, but yeah, it, yeah, you definitely know that. I mean, when I, when I worked at uh, a shop, I, I said to myself once, I was like, I want to do a sort of an experiment to see how many copies of a book that is not, you know, not a hot book right now. Like, I'm not trying to sell Saga to people. I mean, I'm trying to sell Saga to people because it's great, but I'm not like, I was like, I just want to pick a random book that I love. And I, uh, I, Alberto Ponticelli and Josh Dysett's Unknown Soldier. Oh, I was yeah. like, great book. In my top five favorite comics. It had been out for a bunch of years. I looked up how many copies they'd been selling. It's not, wasn't flying off the shelves. And I was like, I want to make this one of the best selling trades for the next couple of months. Yeah. And just like really move in and push it. And I did. And when I met Josh Dysart, like he was like, oh, you know what? Like DC was aware that there was a spike at a store in New York and like, you know, because we were moving, you know, 50, 60 copies a month. And it's like, you notice that stuff. It's, it's comics is so small that, like, <clears throat> certain people, like, taking a shine to a book, like, I mean, careers are made that way at this yeah. point. Like, and yeah, I mean, I can go down the list and name 40 shops who, like, I wouldn't be where I was without them. Like, right. there are just a ton of shops that have been gone above and beyond. And it's not just for me. They do it for other creators. And then there are shops that, like, I have no interaction with, but they are another creator's, like, that was my spot. Right. That was... Um, and so that's always, always fun and interesting, but like, yeah, I mean, when it goes back to what I said about each shop being an ecosystem, but like, yeah, there, you, you know, when you make it like on an indie level, like, I don't know who's taking a ton of X-Men books or Punisher books that I'm writing. Like, I mean, I know some of the people are just because of the size of the shop and the scale, but like, I don't know where it's big. That's not information that like Marvel feels is important to us, but sure. like, Th they want us doing other things and not focusing on that. Um, but when you do an indie book, like, yeah, you you understand exactly who the people are who are, like, making it possible. And, yeah. And it's an, it's an amazing feeling to be able to, like, you know, you know, I come here and I see some of those people and I hug them and um, thank them and always want to just be like, yeah, what, you know, what do you need from me? It's, it's really nice. Like, it is, uh, you know, I always say, like, comics is a community. It's not a, it's not the creative comics community. It's not the retail community. It's not the fan community. It's like, it's all one thing. And right. like, at a show like this or at a good con, like you see that, that like I'm at the bar and I'm talking to retailers and I'm talking to fans and I'm talking to pros and it's just all like, it's all just people who like comics and that's really nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want to, I'm interested in knowing about what role four kids walk into a bank played in your career. Not, I mean, it's a great book. Like, I love Tyler. Like, Tyler is, I mean, I was going to say he's an absolute boss, but that's really on the nose. Yep. But was that in some ways kind of like a business card slash proof of concept to the publishers that, I mean, like Marvel and DC? You didn't design it that way, but it, was that something that brought you to their attention? What's, well, it's actually funny because uh, going back a little further, when I made We Can Never Go Home, like... Uh, you know, We Can Never Go Home is two high school kids with superpowers who get in trouble and go on the run and are, you know, being hunted. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a love letter to, like, you know, Badlands and Bonnie and Clyde and that kind of, like, American road, true romance, like, American outlaw road fiction, which I really love. And, um, but also, like, the superpower angle, someone once, uh, when I started writing Astonishing X-Men, someone was yelling at me on Twitter about something and they were like, you know, you're a hack. And I was like, well, okay, maybe. Um, and, and they said, you know, we can never go home. is just a, you know, shitty audition to write X-Men. And I said, it wasn't that shitty. I got the job. <laughs> um, and like, it's funny cause that is the book that, that Marvel noticed me for, um, mm -hmm. was we can never go home. And I, 
Uh, I did my first stuff at Marvel when that was happening. And like that book did really well and, and um, you know, Josh Hood who drew it is, is, a, is a, just a superstar and a huge talent and um, it was awesome. But for kids was less intentionally like a, sure. that. It was more me and Tyler. It was born from, Tyler was finishing up uh, his senior year at SVA, his final year at SVA and needed to write Needed to draw something, um, <clears throat> needed to draw a comic. He was studying comics at SVA in New York. And I was always coming up with comic ideas and sort of pitching them to him. You know, we'd be in a comic shop at 11 o'clock at night and I'd be like, is this a good idea for a story? And he'd be like, no, not really. And um, I just one night, and like a lot of it was just us trying to make each other laugh. And one night I, I said to him, I was like, well, I was like, I want to do like a, a gritty, hard boiled crime story about. Uh, a bank robbery and he was like okay and I was like but they're children and he was like how old are they and I was like eight and he was like that doesn't make any sense and I was like 11 and he was like that's funny I like it <laughs> and it, I sort of like went home and thought about it and we uh, and like a couple days later he came back to us like hey I have to I'm working on like my thesis and uh, I want to do that kids robbing a bank thing like let's do that like would you mind writing it and I was like, no, sure, why not? Um, and so it was sort of like, the, there's a version of the first issue of Four Kids Walking the Bank that's very different, but that's Tyler's senior project. Um, it's shorter, it's, it's uh, he would say the art is terrible, it is not. I would say the writing is much worse, uh, it is. And so, it, I mean, the book was visualized for that. And then when we finished, like, people at the school were really positive about it. We showed it to some people, they were really amped on it. Um, and then we just like, we're like, hey, let's take this more seriously and do it. Yeah. Um, so like for it to be a, yeah, I mean the, the question of like, is it a business card or like a calling card for us? Like, no, that was not the intention at all. Right. Uh, I mean, in some ways it was a chance for Tyler to try and show off to like, you know, his professors were Klaus Jansen and David Mazzucchelli. So like, right. you want to bring your A game and impress them, but like, for the most part, no, it was just us trying to like make something that would make each other laugh a yeah. lot. But good people, thing they weren't eight year olds. They weren't eight year olds, yeah. I you know, sometimes I'm like, maybe it'd be good if they're eight year olds, but it's <laughs> a lot more absurd. Yeah. Um but the uh they people really responded when it came out and noticed and it did really well and I think like I know a lot of people at Marvel read it and sort of had eyes on it and that definitely like, I was already in the system there and doing some stuff, but that sort of propelled me pretty quickly. Yeah. I mean, a common saying in comics from what I hear is, you know, the best way to, you know, get into comics and to make comics is to just make comics. Yeah. And it's, for a lot, for, for Tyler in particular, it's to be able to get hired for something, you have to have sequentials. You have to have sure. something to show yourself. And yeah, I mean, it's interesting it was that I locked into four kids walk into a bank instead of we can never go home. And that definitely makes a little bit more sense as something that, that Marvel would naturally get attracted to. Yo, everybody. I want to take a second to talk about my friends at TKO Studios. TKO Studios is a new comic publisher that launched with what the New York Times calls an impressive slate of talent. They publish books by top creators, including Roxanne Gay, Jeff Lemire, Garth Ennis, Gabriel Walta, and many more. TKO also does things differently than other publishers. They binge release their books and offer each title in whatever format you most enjoy reading your comics in, whether that's a six issue set in a collector's box, trade paperback, or digital download. I'm a single issues guy, so I went that route and I love the collector's box. Even better, all of TKO's first issues are free to read at tkopresents.com right now. So if you're curious, visit tkopresents.com to give them a try or follow at tkopresents across all social platforms. And if you're a store that's interested in stocking TKO's books, email retailers at tkopresents.com to learn more about one of the best retailer deals in the industry. And now, back to the show. One thing I read in an interview with you that I thought was really interesting was you did the, the DC internship, or the, the, the writing, writer's, program, yeah. writer's program, and you described how it wasn't really a good fit for your style, but at Marvel, you said that it's like writing the way you normally do, but better, 
And I'm, I'm curious why you, not, not, not necessarily why DC didn't fit, but why Marvel allows you to do what you do. Well, I don't think it's a DC versus Marvel thing. Right. The, um, the writer's program, Scott Snyder was a, an amazing teacher and is a good friend. And, um, but what the point of the DC writer's program was, was to take indie writers and sort of teach them how to do epic, to do, you know, as they, they said a lot, like widescreen comics. Like, sure. Michael Bay. Yeah, Michael Bay. Um, but, you know, like Jeff Johns has a, like, epic feel to everything he does. And, you know, a lot of us were in the class. Like, my class, you know, had a lot of, like, Mike Marisi and Chris Sabella and Vita Ayala. Like, we were all in the class together. Like, those are really good writers. Right. But, like, none of us were quite uh, mm. used to. Chris was. Um, Chris, I think, is naturally, Sabella is, like, naturally just, like, you could drop Chris on any project and he's going to do amazing work. But, like, I think for Marisi and, and Vita and me, like, we were doing other things and they were trying to get us to be like universes exploding type stories. And I came in and was just trying to be like, that's not where my head's at. Like I, you know, I, I came in and the first script I wrote for them, like everyone was like, I wanna write Superman, I wanna write Batman. And I wrote a Starling issue. And Starling is a character who appears in nine issues of Birds of Prey. Mm -hmm. I just think she's really cool. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, this is Starling, like going undercover to trap try and stop a drug ring in Gotham and um, you know and it turns out it's her ex-girlfriend who's running it and so there's like it's really complicated and she's kind of a screw up and like not only is she like not necessarily concerned about stopping the drug ring but like maybe she's only there because like she's trying to get her girlfriend back and like the whole thing and I was like I'm really proud of this and they were like it's really good it's not what this is for right. like and I, I had a hard time with that. I was sort of like, um, they were great about it, but they were like, you have to be aiming bigger and, and trying to do the other stuff. Like, that's what we need. Like, we, we don't need, like, the, the, the weird esoteric books. Like, we're not running a class to teach people how to do, like, the weird fringe books. We're teaching a class of people how to be the next heavy hitters of the company. And um, at Marvel, when they brought me in, that wasn't, they weren't like, write Avengers, obviously. Yeah. But I, they were like, write Kingpin. Like, yeah. do, just do a crime book. And I was like, oh, wow, yeah. And they're like, write Rocket Raccoon. And I was like, well, space stuff. And they're like, he's in New York City. And he's just like, getting into trouble. And I was like, oh, yeah, just like, you know, a weird raccoon in New York. Like, and, and that just felt like very much they wanted me to do what I'd been doing, but like, marvel it. And now, you know, and I feel really really happy because I went from that stuff to like uh, Secret Warriors and it's like well this is an ongoing and it's an ensemble and then it was Phoenix Resurrection and it's like well it's a single character book and a character study but it's bigger and right. like a lot of eyes on it and then you know uh, more X-Men stuff and like they've graduated like they took a lot of time and effort and to really help me chart a career where I wasn't kicked into the deep end of the pool but I could develop what they needed naturally. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm forever appreciative, like, you know, everyone at Marvel has been awesome to me and like, you know, they're very aware of like, what their talent does and is good at and. Not try to put you in a box. Yeah, yeah, and like, when they do try and put you in a box, it's to be like, can you punch your way out of this? Like, can, sure. you, can, you, can you rise to the challenge? Can you make this something different? Like, um, and it's it's just been a really like really nurturing place for me to be. Um, I'm a better writer for being there, and I'm you know I'm taking that back to my indie stuff now and and sort of reexamining how I do things. And so yeah, I I can't speak to like what writing at DC is. I wrote one comic at DC. Um, it was before I was in the writers program. Sure. I wrote Black Canary number nine. I'm sure everyone remembers it. It was a big pretty big deal. Black Canary plays a child's birthday party. That's also a really tough book to jump on because, like, Brendan Fletcher and, oh, yeah. and, and uh, Annie Wu were doing such a specific thing. Like, oh, it's, yeah. it's hard to, hey, I'm just going to come in and do the same thing they're doing. Yeah, it was it was really rough. I, like, when I pitched it, uh, my editor, uh, Chris, was awesome. And I pitched all these things, and I was like, you know, they're in a band. And I was like, I used to tour with bands. I used to, and I was like, let me do some, like, real stuff. And I was like, I want to do a van crash story. Like, I want to do a story about, like, 
Black Canary needs to get back to Gotham, but like their van crashed and they're like hurt. And yeah. she doesn't want to leave her band. And Chris was like, yeah, yeah, that sounds cool. Like you're filling in in this book. Like you can't rock their world. <laughs> like you just need to move the ball like an inch so that Brendan can come back and pick it up and tell his story. Sure. And I was like, oh, yeah, I didn't understand. Like I just didn't understand stuff like that because it was my first time doing that stuff. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a child's birthday. It's a fun issue. Um, more attached to it. It's really whatever. It's my only work at DC. Sure. Um, but it was very, uh, yeah, like talking about how DC works. It's possible that DC treats people the same and does the same thing, but like I don't have any experience with that. My experience was the writer's program, which was very specifically designed to build a set of muscles very quickly. Yeah. Um, so. I do think it's interesting. You um, coming in, When you came into Marvel, a whole lot of what was happening there was... Uh, driven in a lot of ways by Brian Michael Bendis. Sure, yeah. And then, like, there was a vacuum because he left. And I, I think it's really cool. And, and Bendis even references an interview recently, which I thought was really interesting, about how he's been excited to see, like, you <clears throat> you, and, like, Kelly Thompson and, like, Ed Brisson. And, like, I actually didn't mention shit, but, like, people, you know, yeah. coming up at that point, having these opportunities because he stepped out. And it's I like the fact that Uncanny relaunched with you and Ed and and Kelly and being able to kind of partner up and you're all kind of in the, I don't I don't want to say same place in their careers but it was interesting to see you three come in especially right after that vacuum kind of opened up sure um Brian Brian is a big part of why I'm at Marvel he was like a big fan of my indie stuff and a, a cheerleader for it which is sort of the most humbling thing for me in my entire career because that's he's the reason I write comics like he is my favorite comic writer and like reading Brian's stuff, I was like, oh, I want to write comics. Like reading Powers made me be like, oh, I want to do this. Like yeah. I, I can't, I don't think I can, but I want to try. Um, and my first, Brian was great to me when I was starting and, and just went above and beyond and was so kind. Um, when I signed exclusive with Marvel, they have a, a creative summit where they bring out um, a bunch of the exclusive writers, like 10 to 14 writers and we sort of plan the year, year and a half, and go over a lot of stuff. And my first summit was Ed's first summit, uh, Ed Brisson, uh, Donnie, Kate's first summit, and Chip Zdarsky's first summit. So it was the first time all four of us had been like in there for this, and it was Brian's last. Wow. Um, it's like accidental passing of the torch. Yeah, yeah. And it was it was great. It was, I mean, I'm... Uh, when Brian left, I was really like, I took it really hard, and and I remember Donnie called me, and I was like, yeah, I'm really just sad Brian's gone. Like, I wanted to work with him, and I wanted to like, really be around him, and like, be able to turn to him for advice. And uh, Donnie was like, yeah, but you were at his last summit. Like, yeah. imagine like if you'd come in a month later, like you wouldn't have ever had that. And I was like, yeah, that's true. And I, actually, as it turns out, like Brian has been. Uh, a big supporter of me over since he left, and and is still a person that I like can turn to for advice, and and I do, but yeah, I mean, uh, Brian's being too sort of modest when he's like, oh, I had to leave for them to get, you know, air. Like, uh, he was as supportive and like to all of us as as possible. Like, he definitely didn't ever do anything to get in anyone's way, but. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really fun to be there now. I think there's an amazing, there's a really great mix of like people who are heroes of mine in comics writing, like uh, Jason Aaron and Mark Wade, and um, and then newer people coming in, and it's you know me and Kelly and Ed and Chip and Donnie and uh, Saladin and um, you know just a whole bunch of people that I'm I'm really excited about, and you know it's it's all over the place. Like it's it's a really good uh Tanahasi is obviously like getting to sit in a room with him is like intimidating and awesome and um you know Nick Spencer and and Jerry Duggan and and Dan Slott like these are people who like are masters at what they do and and so it's 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 fun to have like be the new kid and be excited and enthusiastic and then see that like the people who've been there for a really long time are equally as excited and enthusiastic yeah. and that's like you know a great feeling. 
One thing I really like, so jumping into your, your current Uncanny stuff, I think one thing that's really cool about it is when you read that in the context of, of you know, New Mutants, Dead Souls, and Astonishing, and, and uh, Multiple Man, it's interesting because it feels like it was planned to all be together from mm -hmm. the start, but there's no way you could have been writing New Mutants, Dead Souls with the idea. Maybe, I mean, I guess you could have, that you were going to be writing Uncanny X-Men as a solo writer in the next year and a half. But I mean, it's it's. I like how you are bringing all those characters and those story beats into that and continuing them on. It, it seems, I don't know, it's great. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, when I grew up, like I said, like I grew up on Claremont X-Men and that, that is like, you plant seeds and in three years, yeah. you see something and you're like, oh, that's what that was. That's who, um, and that's really hard to do in the modern age. Like runs are shorter, people are on books like, we play musical chairs a lot more, we're jumping around. So it's really hard to like plan that much. Like if you have a hit book, you have a runaway book, like I'm coming up on writing my 30th issue of Punisher, like, and I planned a lot of Punisher. Like they were like, how much runway do you want? And I was like, a lot, like let me do this. And I gave them a big presentation and they were like, yeah, let's do it, that's fun. Um, but X-Men stuff has always been more in flux. X-Men stuff is very volatile and there were a lot of moving pieces and there still are. Um, early on, uh, when Mark Panucci was the editor, I said, you know, like, I, I would like to, you know, make this my home as much as possible for a while. And he was like, well, it's going to be a miniseries. It's going to be Phoenix Resurrection and then New Mutants. And, um, and I, I thought, well, like, I can stay and do these miniseries and you know, a big a big thing in comics, and it's it's something I don't agree with the mentality of, and I've never uh, never got, but I know it is a fan thing, and I know it is something that people have, which is that like the what comics matter, like mm. you know, a miniseries doesn't matter because it doesn't you know it doesn't change anything, doesn't do anything, and I uh, I hate that idea because I think you know you buy a, a comic to be entertained. If it entertained you, it mattered. If it didn't, probably doesn't matter. Right. Um, but I understand what they mean of like, is this gonna shake things up? Am I gonna see any, is this moving the ball downfield? Is this anything? Um, and I, early on, was like, I want, obviously Phoenix Resurrection, like we're bringing Jean Grey back and there was a plan immediately to go to X-Men Red and you know, I talked to them about doing X-Men Red and um, I, I, thankfully I said, you know, like I, I passed on it and Tom Taylor came in and did it and did you know, a thousand times better job than I would have. But, um, you know, I said, I want New Mutants, like I've done my Gene story, but I, I want to do all these short stories which I could be planting seeds and like leaving threads. Mm -hmm. And and then my hope was just that like, you let me come back to them and you let me let me play with them more. And that's sort of like what I really like doing in the Marvel Universe. And luckily we're in a time when like, all the creators are sort of talking and know each other a little better, so it's easier to do it if you don't pick it up. You can, I can get on the phone with Dan Slott and be like, hey, I left this thing hanging and I'm, I'm not coming back to that area of the universe. Like, can you say something about that? Um, but like, you know, I did the same thing with Tales of Suspense where it's like there's Black Widow and, and Bucky and Hawkeye stuff and like you're seeing some of that in other books. You're seeing it in My Punisher, but you see it in Captain America bits. You see it in different places where like, I left it open and, and did change it, but yeah, I mean, my hope was always that like New Mutants is gonna end and like have a big question mark of where the New Mutants were going. By the time it was ending, I knew actually that I was coming back and I could revisit those characters. Um, and astonishing, like Havoc ends up in jail, like what's gonna happen? But there are certain ones that I was like, I don't know if this will ever pay off, but I'm hoping I can revisit it. Right. Um, and so in my mind, I'm do, I'm, it's my, work around to do what Claremont was a master of. It's sure. my work around to be doing these long form stories that pay off. So like, you know, if you're reading Uncanny and you don't understand where the New Mutants have been and why they're like the, the way they are and why Banshee's the way he is and why Havoc's, you know, the way he is and how, how Cyclops came back, like it's all my work leading up to that. And like, you don't have to read it. You don't have to go out and read Multiple Man to understand why Jamie is like, so standoffish and sort of not not the charging hero that the others are, but like I did build that and I did, you know, hope to pay it off and now I am paying it off, which I feel really lucky that I get to do. So. Mm -hmm.
yeah, I mean, you build, it's like building a car and then hoping that someone is going to build a road for you to drive on. Right. <laughs> and like, you know, I, I was lucky enough that like all the stuff did well and Marvel was so supportive and let me build the road now and now we're, all the parts are in place and now I, you know, I get to cut loose with it, so. Yeah. And now, a word from our sponsor. Yo, everybody, I'd like to take a minute to talk about our sponsors over at Impact Theory Comics. Impact Theory Comics is a new independent publisher, and they're releasing their first comic, Neon Future. Neon Future is a collaboration with world-famous DJ and producer Steve Aoki, and it's written by the Eisner Award-winning writer of Justice, Jim Kruger, with artists Neil Edwards of Fantastic Four fame and Jeremy Rapak delivering the visuals and building the world. Want a first look at the book and Neil and Jeremy's art? Give Impact Theory a follow on Instagram at, at ITComics. If you like what you see and you're a fan of science fiction, this might be the comic for you. So head over to your local comic book shop and get Neon Future number one on your poll list ASAP. And now, back to the show. One of the, so before we start recording, we were talking about how you often are, people often think that you probably were a fan of X-Men the Animated Series. Uh-huh. I, I never really thought that reading your work. If, if I could pick one thing that I feel like you definitely were a fan of, it would be Peter David's X Factor. Oh yeah. Like that, I mean, first off, I'm a, I'm a huge Jamie Madrox fan. Sure. I, I don't know why he's always been so appealing. Actually, I think part of it is you had that scene in Multiple Man where the two Jamies were fighting and Beast was telling him about how this is why everybody hates you. Yeah, yeah. And it was just like, I was like, that is, that is so quintessentially like Jamie slash like Peter David's X Factor. Yeah. Um, how does, I mean, obviously you're, you're not doing like a Peter David homage or something like that, but how does, like, what appealed to you, I guess, about that book and that type of X-Men story? Oh, I mean, you know, uh, the, like, the classic, the, the 90s X-Factor Peter David stuff is amazing, and I love it, but it's the 2000s detective agency stuff oh, that, yeah. like, to me just felt like it, it opened up what the Marvel Universe could be in a way that, like, a lot of other books have done, but it just, like, it opened it up further, and I was just like, "Oh, this can be anything. Like, yeah. You really can do anything." And like, it's just such deep character dives. It's such great characters, and they're just so alive, and you know them so well. And like, that was an early thing for me when I started. Like, Phoenix Resurrection did really well at the company, and they, you know, took me aside and were like, "This did well for us. Like, thank you. Like, what do you want? Like, right. where do you want to go?" And I first thing I said was like, "I want to bring Multiple Man back." Yeah. And there was a moment of like. Where they had to be like, no, you don't understand. Like, this did well. Like, you have currency with us now. What would you like to be doing? And it was a real, like, do you want Wolverine? Like, do you want to be doing X Force? And I was like, yeah, multiple man. <laughs> and just like the look of dejection on everyone's face of like, God, he's such an asshole. Like, why is he <laughs> like this? And that's like, it's a sort of constant for me there of just like, I want to do things that they're just like, why do you want to do this? But multiple man, like, and they, they were awesome and, and let me do what I wanted and, um, you know, early on they were like, yeah, you're going to really be leaning into the Peter David. And I was like, no, like, I love the Peter David stuff. If you want Peter David X Factor stuff, like, let Peter do it. Like, he's, You don't want to be a cover band. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm not going to do it nearly as well as Peter will. Like, bring him in. Like, I want you to do that. I just want to get the pieces on the board so that he can do it if he wants. Or like, you know, someone else can do something with him. Um, so it's like, you know, a lot of people when it was coming out, when it was going to get ready to come out, were like, oh yeah, this is going to be like Rosenberg's Peter David impression. And I was like, I, it's a love letter to Peter David, not written to be Peter David. And um, and that's how I viewed it. I was like, I, I want to do something very different, like stuff that he doesn't wasn't really doing in that book with all of that in mind. And like, I remember it was a big thing because people were like, oh, is Layla Miller going to be in it? And I just, because I you know, don't like giving everything away on the internet. I was like, no. And people were so mad. And they were like, how could Layla not be in it? Like, she's such an important part of his life and he settled down with her. And I was like, we're not touching that. And like, she's in the book, she's in issue two. I just wanted people to like, go in and, and read the like, comic, read the comic and, and experience it like the way we want it to be experienced and not have, like people are building all these ideas of what we were doing and what we weren't doing. And I was like, I don't need to give you any more ammunition to build you know, your own guesses, like just go into the book. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that X-Factor stuff, uh, you know, my, my idea on the X-Men has always been like, 
there are a few unique types of X-Men stories. There's like the sort of lighthearted, fun book that's like more of a family, you know, more family and character driven. There's the like backs to the wall apocalyptic stuff. There's there's the complete bizarre weirdness, you know. And there's all these facets. There's space opera, right. and I, I'm not a space X Men space guy. I love that stuff, but I like it's not something I ever wanted to write. Um, and that's sort of what I tried to touch on, like like there's the kids in over their heads kind of dynamic. And I I plotted when I did all these books and what I was reaching for. I was like, I want to touch sort of all these parts. Like I want to do, you know, the ecstatic style wackiness and just nonsense and like Dadaist storytelling of, of that and I was like I want to do that and that's what Multiple Man is and I was like I want to do the like kids in over their heads and just like you know always fighting the insurmountable but just being like this is what we do we're scrappers and that's what New Mutants is and I wanted to do the like you know the real like lovable messed up family dynamic and that's what Astonishing X-Men was and like the heavy soap opera and that's what Phoenix Resurrection was and then I was like and all that builds to the like you know uh, mutant massacre like style like this is it like uh, these are the backs to the wall like who are we yeah so like it was very conscious decision on my part of like what I was doing and sort of trying to touch on all the tones of X-Men that I really like I didn't want to just be doing like oh I write X-Men that's funny or like I write X-Men that's dark and like it's 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 interesting because I talk to people who are like I really like Astonishing and Multiman because they're funny and then Uncanny's not funny at all, and I'm like yeah it's a, it's a very different thing yeah and and like I know it throws people but like I, I'm trying to like you know I, I'm trying to have readers enjoy the book but I'm also trying to like it means so much to me to be doing these books that like I, I was like well while I'm here like I want to do uh, like my sort of tribute and love letter to all the different types of X Men stories that I care about. And so that's sort of, you know, where we are. It's like, it's for the fans and it's for readers and they've all been great for the most part. But uh, it's also for me to just sort of be like, I, 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 I love this kind of book and I want to see if I can do it and like I want to pay tribute to it. So um, yeah, that's where like the Peter David stuff is very emblematic of, of a, a branch of X-Men storytelling that, I'm, that is very near and dear to me. Yeah, well I mean, I, I talk about this with people on the podcast a lot, but I, I always think it's you you can't write for other people. If you don't if, if you don't write for what the story is to you, yeah, no one's gonna connect with it. For like sure. you, if you don't connect with it, you're just doing like I don't know. I don't know, I don't even know what you would be doing. I don't even know why you'd be writing. And so that's that's why it's so interesting because like you have to the story has to kind of like reveal itself to you. Like for astonishing, the thing I like about astonishing a lot is everybody was kind of washed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just like Colossus is in his like room with like a beard and he's like super depressed and there's just yeah. garbage everywhere. Yeah. I mean, like that was that, that was nice. You don't really get to see the X-Men like that because normally they're these superheroes and everything like that. But I mean, I love that. Um, but I, I wanted to bring up, you, you were talking about how, you know, you, you suggested Multiple Man and Marvel was like, wh- what the hell? Uh-huh. I love that your uncanny team is just so kind of all over the place. Yeah. Because you got, you know, Cyclops and Wolverine in classic costumes, no less, mm-hmm. uh, 90s and brown. And then you have Magic and Moonstar, Havoc and Karma, Madrox and Wolfsbane. So it's like you kind of, you have bits of your books, but you also have bits of those flavors from those different yeah. runs in there. And it's, I'm just, was that something that, Marvel was on board with right from the start or did you kind of get like a what are you doing type face when you suggested that team? Uh, no, I mean, you know, early on um, Jordan White and CB were like, you know, when, when we go forward, like the idea of what we've been building towards in Disassembled, me and Kelly and Ed, we knew that there was going to be Age of X-Men. Like that was, you know, we knew that was coming and we were setting that up and building that to get, you know, whoever was going to do it to come on, Zach and Lonnie ended up being the people who did it but um early on there was talk and i was you know i I don't remember whose idea it was i remember talking about it a lot but i don't think it was my idea originally but i said i think if we're taking them and doing a sort of age of apocalypse like a utopian age of apocalypse kind of thing i was like the story to tell is like the x-men left behind like who didn't go yeah and they were like very intrigued by that and they were like who should it be and i was like cyclops like that was my first was just like yeah 
he comes back ready to lead and there's no one left to lead. I do, I do like the idea that the guys who are gone already are the ones who are left to pick up the pieces. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, you know, they, they, they abdicated the throne, Cyclops and Wolverine, by dying. But, yeah. um, and they've come back to find the kingdom in ruins. And, like, that was a big thing. And, and I said Cyclops, and then they were like, well, I remember uh, CB and Jordan called, and they said, uh, what do you think of it, Cyclops and Wolverine? And I was like, I, you know. Yes. I could be convinced. <laughs> yeah, I was like, well, I think that's, you know, my dream book, but okay, yeah. And and then from there, they were very much like, what what do you see it being? Because like a lot of it, like we were still building uh, Disassembled, so we were deciding like who stays and who goes. And and at the same time, like Ed was taking X-Force, and so he, we were picking people out uh. to be like, these people are going to be in X-Force, like these are, and that was the thing, like the end of New Mutants, when New Mutants ends, that this might be like, you know, too inside baseball, too much how the sausage is made. But at the end of New Mutants, like, Magic sees Boom Boom and and Richter and those characters, and she doesn't let them get taken. She sends them away, and fans were like, "Why? Why?" And like, part of it, I think it's a great sort of selfless act for Magic that she's willing to fall, and and I love that moment. But also, we needed Richter to be in the Shatterstar book and. Ed wanted Boom Boom and X Force, and so it was like, well, I can't turn them into aliens because <laughs> then they're gonna have to immediately unturn them into aliens. Yeah. Um, so that's why they they vanish. Um, you know, it's a two pronged. Like I think it works well for the story, but also it works well for the stories going forward. Um, and so we were already building that, and then I, you know, said like, well, I have all these threads. I have a thread from Astonishing. I have a thread from New Mutants. I have a thread from Multiple Man. Like, can I pull those in? And they love that idea. And then there are more teammates coming um, that I think people are going to be surprised by. And some of those were people that I intentionally kept back during Disassembled. And, and you know, some of them are like, some of them fans are like, where is this person? Why have they been gone? And it's like, well, we're going to explain that. We're going to explain where they've been and what they've been doing. Um, but yeah, I wanted to pull from, you know, obviously, like when you're talking Cyclops and Wolverine, like those are you know, those are flag-bearing members of, like, eras. Like, Cyclops is original five, and Wolverine is, you know, giant size. Like, those are the guys, I mean, you think of all of them, but, like, they are very emblematic of those times. And so I wanted to sort of go through and pick, you know, to me it's like after that it's New Mutants, and then it's... Um, and so there is a decision to kind of go through and, and pick various people through different eras and, and really, like, bring them together. I sort of wanted... I, I spent a long time being like, can I have someone from every sort of defi clearly defined era, and that's what the team is, is like one member, but it didn't, it didn't work cohesively. Like I have all these lists and charts of like, what would sure. the team look like if it was this? And I was like, you know, trying to roughly assemble it. I have no Photoshop abilities, but trying to like just literally find images and put them together to be like, what do they look like standing next to each other? Like what does this feel like? And at a certain point I was like, this is not, making for a better story, it's making for a better concept and yeah. I need to abandon it, so. Yeah. But that is the idea, is just that like, we end up with a, a, the last X-Men, you know, on Earth are, are spread out from all sorts of different eras. And I'm really excited because like, I kind of wanted to use Dust a lot, uh, I really like Dust, and so we kept her out of Disassembled, and then I couldn't make it work, and I was like, I'm gonna have to explain where Dust is and then right when that was happening, Jim's up, called me, and he's like, I really want dust. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> and I was like, yes, please. Like, and I, he was like, what do I need to know? And like, we talked about it, and he had great ideas. And he's like, yeah, I just want dust and champions. And I was like, oh, this is perfect. And it was like just serendipity that like Jim wanted her, and we'd done what we needed to keep her out. But like, it, it's one of those like really happy coincidences. But uh, I was so happy to have him do that. And now he's taking Cyclops over for a little bit to like talk to them. And you know, that's what's fun about the Marvel Universe is like you build all these things and you have toys left over and other people come and take them and yeah. Yeah. It, it's been cool. Uh, I just have a couple more questions. Sure. This this one's really quick. I mean it's not even really a question. I just think that a really great thing that you did that you and you and Salvador did that matches what you're talking about, the the, the people left behind, is the fact that Wolverine went to like the remnants of the X-Mansion and just found whatever costumes he could. It was like, 
it was it was a nice little touch to like the hodgepodge nature of the book, and it's I don't know. Also, it helps when people are getting really excited because '90s Cyclops's costume is back. Yeah, um, I right away I said um, I want them in the Jim Lee costumes, and Marvel's like okay, but and I was like no, this is not like Wolverine's <laughs> in the brown, Cyclops is in the uh, you know the the bandolier um, pouches, and. They were like, okay, and and uh, what's funny is that I put Havoc in his classic costume and Astonishing. It's slightly tweaked, Greg Land slightly tweaked it, but it's basically the classic, and I was like, Havoc's gonna be in that classic. And Salvador La Roca <laughs> emailed me and was like, can we put him in this one instead? And I was like, I don't know. I kind of want it to be all these classic costumes. And then I got a note that was like, Salvador designed that costume. And oh I was my like, God. I was like, oh, okay, yeah. I was like, well, it's his costume. Like, yeah, uh, uh, sure. So like I've had a bunch of people be like, why is Havoc in that one? And I was like, Salvador's costume. Like he wants to bring his suit back. <laughs> That's understandable. Um, yeah, totally. And I was happy to do it. But yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of what the book is is like we're trying to look forwards and backwards at the same time. Right. Like it's about reflecting on what they've done and trying to figure out where they could go and, and why they still matter and can they survive. And I was like, you know, nothing is going to be better for that than like full nostalgia costumes and like I said that and and Marvel went for it and they thought I wasn't going to explain it at all that they were just going to be in those costumes because yeah. like they change costumes all the time like Dazzler changes her costume every comic she's in and just like Dazzler just likes costumes like that's just in her personality but I actually wrote the explanation and they were like oh that's funny that you would do that <laughs> and I was like yeah I think it's you know but it wasn't my intention I it, when I when I pitched it I was just like yeah that's just what they wear yeah like I don't know why yeah but it was a good explanation thank you um, I also, I, you were talking about like how future and past and everything like plays a part in X Men, and I, I think it's such a, it's such an interesting group of characters in line because I don't think there's a single part of any superhero universe that is more. I sh shudder to use the word cursed by its past, but it's constantly looming. Sure. The, the past, like for fans and for the comics themselves. And it's it's interesting because it seems like especially in 2019 that like delivers unique challenges to you as a storyteller, which you've already spoken spoken about. But it is interesting because it's like a lot of it, like if 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 I was if 2019 was when the Dark Phoenix saga was coming out, man, that would be a way different time. You're like, whoa, why is Jean Grey getting like evil? Oh, yeah, I don't yeah, understand. Yeah. But I don't know. It's 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 interesting to watch because you're trying to. It's like you have to manage expectations and start like saying that like the the beat is coming. Yeah, and trust me as a storyteller that I will take you there. It's it it is interesting because you know when I went into writing X Men, I was sort of like I'm an X Men fan. Like it, we're all on the same team, right? And X Men fans aren't all on the same team at all. Like there are you know tons of different you know people who grew up on Stan Lee X Men, people who grew up on Claremont, people who Jim Lee. Gr grew up on Jim Lee, people who grew up on Grant Morrison, Joss Whedon, like, uh, you know, the the new X-Men kids, like, uh, the cartoons, like, they're all have very different takes on what the X-Men is. Yeah. And when I started, when I started running X-Men, you know, Axel Alonso said to me, he was like, every X-Men fan has an idealized team of five X-Men, and you're never going to build that for them and they're always going to be disappointed. Yeah. And I was like, "Oh, that's crazy." But it is like an interesting thing you see that like it's so personal. Like the X-Men is such a personal book to everyone who reads it and it is so these are friends and family and people they love and I get that and like I love them, but I I grew up in the Claremont era of like we love the X-Men because they're they're there's tragedy inherent in the X-Men. There's there's certain like hardships inherent and it's about them overcoming them. And like for other people, that's not what the X-Men is. Right. And so that's an interesting thing. Like um Well there's no way you can please everybody. Yeah, for sure. But like, you know, we, we have a couple X-Men die in our book and a, a couple more are going to. Um Rest in peace, Guido. Rest in peace, Guido. And people one, there's an expectation that like they're characters I don't care about. Right. And it's like strong guys in my top. Ten oh. favorite Marvel characters. Like, yeah. I love him so dearly. Uh, it was not, it was not with a, you know, light touch that I killed him. But like, 
uh, th we're building something and it's going somewhere and it's it's he is he is the bloody footprints we're leaving behind us and so is blindfold and so is Loa um, and like um, I love blindfold like I think she's a great character and that's why I set her up to be the framework for like everything I'm doing and like she she is she is the specter that is going to haunt Scott Summers mm -hmm. um, throughout my run and like uh, question you know she is the question mark hanging over what the X-Men are is like Loa's life is blindfold's life and like what it means and what it meant and like um, so like it, it, it is interesting to to take you know try and figure out what expectations you can meet and like you know I, all I can tell fans is like I don't do any of this lightly I don't do any of this because I don't care like I care deeply and like maybe your favorite character isn't my favorite character or isn't whoever's favorite character but like I understand what it is to see a favorite character hurt and, and killed, but I also, like, um, you know, well, I have a job to do, but more than that, like, we're telling a bigger story and, like, you know, we're early enough that people don't know what the story is yet and don't understand it and, you know, we're giving it out in pieces and parcels, but finding out, you know, what what that story is and seeing how it meets different people's expectations is very... It's fascinating. It's really, it's really fun and and um, you know, terrifying yeah, <laughs> at the yeah. same time. Um, you know, I, I've been sitting here for at the show for four days, and like people, you know, it, this book, Uncanny X Men. I mean, obviously, it's the biggest thing I've ever done, but it's also, you know, the way people come up to me and talk to me about what it means to see what I've been doing is like really overwhelming and like. You know, as much as I was like, this is my favorite comic of all time. This is the most important thing I may ever do in my life. Like, and I honestly believe that. But seeing fans react to it, like, I tried to brace for, like, every possible outcome of, like, what if everybody fucking hates it? <laughs> and, like, what if everybody loves it? And every middle point. And, like, even the, like, I'm more of a sort of pessimistic person. So, like. I was much more prepared for just like a lo line of people to come and spit on me. Right. But like the people, I was not at all like, I. it's been really overwhelming being out here. Like the way people are reacting to the book and, and the messages I get online are really like, it's heavy and it, it's it's really wonderful that people are reacting and liking it, but it's also like, you know, I, feel, I feel it every time I open my laptop that I'm like, this is it. Like this is the X-Men. This is, you know, the most important piece of fiction to a whole lot of people in their lives, including myself. Like, you know, I'm I'm just one torchbearer in a long line and there's, you know, people coming after me. Um, you know, I the the thing I always think about and it's something that me and Donnie Cates always say is like, at the end of the day, like, these toys aren't breakable. Like, they're so much bigger than us mm -hmm. that like, if you hate what I'm doing, like, Maybe the next person you're gonna love, like. Um, I mean, you're writing a comic with two previously dead people, at yeah, least. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and and so I, you know, I hope people can go into the comic and understand the way they work and everything. But also, like, yeah, I just uh, the the idea that like these are toys that we can't break. Like, we're not strong enough to break the X Men. I can't do anything to the X Men that will not. If it doesn't work, won't be undone, won't be fixed, and won't be buried somewhere. But also, like, uh, I feel like my role in the X-Men is, like, to play with the toys as rough as I can and see that they come out the other way because that's what they mean to a lot of people, um, myself included, is, like, when I was a kid, like, they were my heroes because, you know, I was watching them come through stuff that no one else could come through. Yeah. And, like, that's the story I want to tell is, like, can they still do that, and what does that mean? And so I don't know. It's it's a uh, it's an intense job, but it is it is. I wouldn't trade it for the world. Well, I hate to end in such a cliche fashion, but I hope you survive the experience. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming on, Matthew. I really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Off Panel with writer Matthew Rosenberg. You can find him on Twitter at, at Ashcan Press and his work in Uncanny X Men. If you're a fan of Off Panel, make sure to check it out on Patreon. If you back the show on there, you not only support it, but you get early access to each week's podcast. 
access to exclusive written and audio content, and more. Also, don't forget to subscribe to Off Panel on iTunes or Stitcher and give the show a rating or review while you're at it. You can find Off Panel on social media by liking it on Facebook at Slash Sketched, that's S K T E C H D, following on Twitter at, at Sketch Comic, or following me at, at Slice Fried Gold. Big thanks to all my existing patrons, including Anthony Rubin, Keegan Ray, Milton Lawson, Wesley Gift, Sean Kirkham, Harry Small, Alistair Ross, Julio Anta, Gus, Andrew Scott, Brett A. Schmidt, Jason Goodmanson, Johan Barander, Paul Reinwand, Connor Farner, Vita Yella, JDC and Matt Cagnon, Aditya Bittikar, Tara Ferguson, Dave Slusher, Kieran Mark Antonio, WMQ Comics, Akil, Greg Lockard, Kokachi, Phil White, Ben Becker, Sean Pinnell, Kent Heidelman, Philip Seavey, Al Ewing, Ryan Alcock, Nick Michelin, David Kelly, Robert Wilson IV, Nick Polito, Aaron Owen McCready, Brendan Fletcher, Gary Maloney, Jonathan Nielsen, Matthew Groom, Jason Nassie, Adam Bogert, Xavier Files, Maria Schweitzer, Matthew Taylor, Tyler Turner, Nick Patera, Jacob Sorelli, Ford Gilmore, David Baraldi, Evan Blazer, Brian McRae, Ira James Udaskin, Modern Magic Stories, Nick Hall, Bruno Batista, Bobby Angus, Bjorn Basin, John Hendricks, Steve Anderson, Phil Dahl, Ian Maxfield, Cliff Chang, Benjamin Shipper, Colin McMahon, Chris Palmer, Maxwell Schmidt, Scott McGovern, Nathan Fairburn, Kent McKenzie, Nicholas Kessley, Greg Rucka, Adam Highfield, Nicholas Gardner, Andrew Corgan, Fiona Staples, Chris Morris, Chris O'Halloran, Mark cabinet mike murphy michael shirley tom barnett jim dimonacos norbert nick glow james kaplan and mission comics and art in san francisco you guys are all the best a quick thanks to upright t-rex music who wrote and performed off panels theme song just for the show check out their music on spotify because it's completely delightful thanks for listening and tune in next week for another episode